Hi, I'm Matt Damon, and welcome to Journey to Planet Earth. In this episode, we explore the link between environmental change and the spread of infectious disease. We will visit a world where billions of people are without clean drinking water or proper sanitation services. But we'll also see that travel, commerce, and tourism have put newly emerging diseases on our very own doorstep. I think you'll find it a timely and important investigation, so please join me now as our journey begins. In the 1970s, new vaccines and antibiotics seemed to be winning the war against infectious diseases. Most scientists were confident that the major contagious killers were retreating. HIV AIDS put an end to all that. In the last 30 years, there has been a dramatic upsurge of infectious diseases all over the world. Not just AIDS, but insect and waterborne diseases too. Malaria, cholera, and dengue fever are spreading fast. National boundaries, even the well-policed ones, are porous. Can we keep global pandemics away from our shores? In the United States, West Nile virus is already rampant. Will the West be any safer from these diseases than it was from HIV? Join us now as Journey to Planet Earth investigates how environmental change is fostering the tide of contagion which threatens to engulf us all. Our journey begins here, along the shores of East Africa's Lake Victoria. Shared by Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, this is one of the world's largest freshwater lakes. Its waters sustain more than 30 million people. Each morning, the villagers of Kumbewa, a small fishing settlement in Kenya, prepare to work Lake Victoria's shallow but fertile waters. As the men ready their nets and boats, the women sort through what's left of yesterday's catch. If the weather holds and they find the right feeding grounds, the fishermen could earn twice Kenya's average income for a day's labor. It almost seems like an idyllic way of life. But this region is located in one of Africa's unhealthiest environments. Lake Victoria is the malaria capital of the world. 3,500 children live in the village of Kumbewa. Over 600 will never see their fifth birthday. The towns along Lake Victoria are located on the equator. The weather is hot and steamy, the perfect breeding ground for the deadly Anopheles mosquito, the only carrier of malaria. Hospitals can't begin to handle the burden. At any given time, as much as 80% of the local population may be infected with malaria. Doctors Jose Stute and Alfred Odindo are studying malaria's effect on the most vulnerable, young children. Does he also have malaria? He has malaria. Children here are repeatedly exposed to one bout of malaria after another, after another, after another, until they begin, begin to develop immunity. But in the meantime, they're susceptible to complications from those repeated attacks. And that's why uh, children here have a high mortality from malaria. 
How are you? Little Yvonne Diambo is three years old and just recovering from her fourth bout with malaria. She still hasn't developed an immunity to the disease. If she can survive a few more years, she may be one of the lucky ones. And how old is she? So she's doing well now. Okay. In this region, 20% of children under the age of five die of malaria. The reality is that it doesn't have to be that way. Malaria is a curable disease. Most of the fatalities occur due to the lack of adequate drug supplies and adequate healthcare facilities. Though the village of Kambewa has been hit hard by malaria, the people are now faced with an equally dangerous threat. Today was not a good day for fishing. It's been this way for some time. Although they appear calm, the men work with a sense of urgency. Raw sewage, overfishing, and agricultural runoff are slowly destroying the lake's ecosystem. Livelihoods and traditional lifestyles are threatened. Many are left with few choices but to abandon their ancestral fishing grounds and migrate to larger cities. Despite the optimism suggested by a soft drink advertisement, reality here is harsh. Local bus stations are jammed. Most are escaping from severe economic pressures. They bring with them all their possessions. Very little is left behind, including the lethal malaria parasite. The most popular destination is only six hours away. Once a small trading post in the middle of the grasslands, Nairobi is now a metropolis of over two million people. At first glance, Kenya's capital seems like a prospering modern city. People in the West have a romantic view of Africa. If they think about Kenya, they think about the, the savanna and these huge herds of elephant and antelope and lions. But in fact, modern Africa is really much more like this, with large cities like Nairobi that act as magnets to bring people in from the countryside where they're having a trouble making a living. When they come into a city like Nairobi, they bring with them a nucleus for epidemics. Nairobi is ringed with impoverished shanty towns like Kaibera. Over 250,000 migrants are crowded into less than two square miles. For those fleeing from the environmental and economic hardships of Lake Victoria, life here is even harder. Unemployment is over 80 percent. Nearly all live on less than two dollars a day. With no sanitation facilities, Kibera suffers from a variety of deadly infectious diseases. Even the act of collecting a few drops of tainted water is a daily struggle. Yet until recently, Nairobi was malaria-free. Today, it's hit the city with a vengeance. Thousands of children are infected, and the epicenter is Kibera. Medical researchers Amy Corman and Juma Makasa are investigating the outbreak. Malaria is generally considered um, a disease of rural areas, um, not really a disease of cities. We're trying to determine the extent to which malaria is transmitted in Nairobi. You need three things. You need people that have malaria, you need the mosquito to transmit it, and you need to verify that the mosquito is actually carrying the malaria parasites. The research team suspected that the massive migration from the countryside was linked to the spread of malaria. 
when they come into a city like Nairobi, they bring with them the diseases from their homes, but they also change the environment so that mosquitoes that transmit malaria are able to breed more readily. And that is exactly what researchers discovered. The Anopheles mosquito was present in Nairobi because the environment was changing. Typical of many newly arrived slum dwellers, Paulina Carugo grows vegetables on a small plot of land behind her home. But in the process, she and hundreds of others have unknowingly created the perfect breeding ground for the Anopheles mosquito, a hot zone of infection. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. You have high density housing and you have agricultural practices right next to this housing that are good places for mosquitoes that carry malaria to grow up in. If, if the season is good for mosquito development, you may have a transmission going on in an area where you don't normally associate it. The implications of what was discovered in Nairobi are significant. There is a definitive link between the spread of infectious disease and man-made changes to the environment. It's happening in Kenya, and it's happening in some of the most remote places on the planet. the high valleys and jungles of Peru. These are some of the greatest stands of tropical rainforests in the world. Through dense vegetation, perennially shrouded in mist, here water slowly courses down the eastern slopes of the Andes. It all eventually flows into the vast basin of the Amazon River. In the depths of the jungle, just as in Nairobi, people are suddenly dying of malaria. This crisis has brought to Peru a team of international scientists their mission takes them downstream on a remote tributary of the Amazon. Their goal is to enter the hot zone of infection and discover the cause of the epidemic. Field researcher Amy Vitor is from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Ten years ago, there was virtually no malaria in this area. Around 1997, malaria had risen so much that a third of the whole population had had it in a single year. Now we're at a stage where pretty much everyone has had malaria at least once, some as many as 13 times. Amy and her assistant begin by visiting villages that are suffering the most fatalities. They are looking for the slightest clues that could explain the mystery. She also asks questions and patiently listens to their stories. But she learns nothing that would suggest the cause of the epidemic. She keeps searching for answers, knowing only one thing for sure. In 1965, there were only 1,500 cases of malaria in all of Peru. Today, it's over 165,000. In a Bora village, the tribal leader explains how malaria affects his people. Before, they used to sleep without mosquito nets. Now, it's impossible, he says. He also reports that the Bora children are being repeatedly infected, and the situation is getting worse. Three have died in just the last week.
Amy's research takes her deeper into the jungle, closer to the center of the hot zone. She is aware that one cause of the epidemic may be the abandonment of mosquito eradication programs, a result of Peru's recent economic crisis. Obviously, the economics plays a major role, and other factors such as the amount of health care available, people's behavior, all these things play into malaria prevalence. But she thinks there may be something else behind the epidemic. For months, Amy collects water samples from streams and rivers surrounded by dense forest. She's looking for the larva of the malaria-carrying Anopheles mosquito. In nearly every location, none are found. Then Amy confirms her suspicions. When she samples water from deforested areas, there is clear evidence of a widespread infestation of the Anopheles mosquito. Everything points toward a link between malaria and the clear cutting of the rainforest. Deforestation causes numerous changes in ecology. The soil composition, changes in the pH of water, uh, the amount of shade that comes down to the forest floor, um, all these things change, and as these things change, then the amount of breeding sites available for malarious mosquitoes also changes. People like the Bora have always cleared small gardens like this, in which they grow the manioc and bananas on which they depend. In this classic slash and burn agriculture, the impact is not nearly as severe as it looks. Most gardens are rotated, and the forest is allowed to grow back. It has been practiced for millennia by the indigenous people of the Amazon. But today, huge expanses of the rainforest are being clear-cut for cattle ranching. Here, there is no rotation. The forest is not allowed to grow back. Amy and her team have found that recently cleared open pastures are perfect breeding grounds for the Anopheles mosquito. Each day as Amy records her findings, she knows the importance of her research. Globally, malaria kills over two million people every year, mostly the poor who can't afford medication. This makes the Anopheles mosquito the greatest killer of man in the animal kingdom. The bottom line really is that we're changing the ecology in a dramatic way and we don't really know what our consequences are. The spread of malaria is not the only consequence of clearing the rainforest, but it may turn out to be one of the most devastating. Cut down at the rate of a thousand acres a day, the Amazon is being cleared to make way not just for farmland, but for towns too. One of the great concerns for the future is that insect-borne diseases are adapting to cities. Malaria is one, but there are others. This is the port city of Iquitos. Built in the heyday of the rubber boom, it still remains the center of commerce on the upper Amazon River. But those living in its sprawling shanty towns not only suffer from an upsurge of malaria, they have become victims of another mosquito-borne disease, dengue fever. 10 years ago, it posed no threat. Today, dengue has reached epidemic proportions. 5% of its victims will die. Once again, research shows that cities can create their own ecology of disease, making them ripe for colonization by mosquitoes. In Iquitos, collectors search for the mosquito Aedes aegypti, Anything that holds water is a potential breeding ground. 
In the hundreds of old tires, basins, and wells of the shanty towns, Aedes aegypti has found its ideal environment. Its larvae thrive in these stagnant waters. Epidemics in Iquitos would have once seemed remote from the developed world. But this city has become a favorite destination of eco-tourists. And with daily flights to the U.S. and Europe, no disease outbreak stays local for long. Dengue is really a global problem. The interesting thing about Aedes aegypti is it's a completely urbanized mosquito. It has adapted to human beings, and as a result, it can travel with them on airplanes, on boats, and people actually can move virus or the dengue virus around the world rapidly as well. Travel, commerce, and tourism have put places like Iquitos and Nairobi on the doorstep of the West. In the United States and Europe, they eradicated malaria and most other insect-borne diseases in the 1950s. That doesn't mean they're gone for good. At New York's Kennedy Airport, they are alert to the problem. Every day, over 300 flights arrive from other parts of the world, carrying not just people, but plants and animals, too. All of them are inspected. Each year, the United States spends $350 million to protect its borders from infectious diseases. Careful attention is paid to horses. They are often carriers of lethal diseases. Blood samples are taken, and the animals are put into quarantine until the results come back. We test them for four different diseases which don't exist in this country. And we test them out, and if they come out positive, they have an option to take the horses back to the country of origin, or we destroy them here. Despite all of the precautions, it's simply impossible to stop every disease from entering the United States. During the summer of 1999, New York City became a hot zone for a rare and deadly virus. A mosquito-borne disease from a remote part of Africa crossed the Atlantic and forged a foothold in America. In early August, thousands of crows started dropping out of the sky. Three weeks later, an 80-year-old woman died of encephalitis. Within weeks, another 56 cases were reported. Seven people died. Health officials were puzzled, then alarmed. Attention quickly shifted to high-security laboratories that study toxic diseases like anthrax and Ebola. Scientists started dissecting dead birds, looking for clues that could confirm their suspicion that the virus that affected birds was also lethal to humans. Eventually, the disease was isolated. It was something never before found in the Western Hemisphere. West Nile virus. No one knows how it got here. Though so personally, I believe it arrived here in an infected mosquito, hitching a ride in an airplane. If we want to be able to have the freedom to travel around the world, this is one of the side effects. Today, phone banks across the nation receive reports of dead birds. Since its entry into New York, West Nile virus has become a public health threat to an entire continent. Thousands of people have already been infected. And what kind of bird was spotted? Are the feet, legs, and beak all solid black? Last name? During the summer months when mosquitoes are most active, the calls never seem to stop. 
And are you reporting a dead or a dying bird? And would you be willing to preserve this by placing it in a plastic bag? Okay, your report will now be forwarded to a local health department to have someone come by to get the bird either today When birds or start dying, there's a good chance West Nile is not far behind. It's also an early warning signal to initiate mosquito control measures, like the selective spraying of pesticides. West Nile thrives in the neat backyards and gardens of suburbia. It preys on the weak and the elderly. In wealthy countries like the United States, resources are available to fight mosquito-borne outbreaks. For now, most public health officials don't expect West Nile to become a greater threat. But West Nile really has served as a wake-up call. Uh, the introduction of West Nile into the United States, a virus which has never been here before, illustrates the possibility for other pathogens, other viruses, bacteria, to come into the United States. Health authorities believe that West Nile could be a harbinger of things to come. It reinforces the fact that disease knows no borders. Yet there is a global health issue even greater than insect-borne diseases looming for the 21st century. It revolves around the most basic human need, water, clean water. There are 1.1 billion people worldwide that don't have access to basic clean drinking water and, and two and a half billion people worldwide that don't have access to sanitation services that, that we take for granted. And the direct implication of this failure to provide basic human needs for water are water-related diseases. The effects of waterborne diseases are devastating. In the poorest regions of the world, diarrhea alone claims the lives of nearly three million children each year. As people flood into cities, the problems of sanitation, clean water, and the spread of waterborne diseases become even more urgent. And that's exactly what happened 4,000 miles and a world away from New York City. Once a small Spanish colonial port on the Pacific, Peru's capital, Lima, has become a bustling, overcrowded metropolis of nearly 9 million people. In the wealthier parts of town, water is piped in from the mountains. Its abundance makes it hard to believe that the city is located in one of the driest deserts in the world. In the slums sprawling across the arid landscape that surrounds Lima, the lack of water is a brutal reality. Their hardships are almost unimaginable. Most live with no electricity. Their huts are made of sticks, straw matting, and salvaged bits of corrugated steel. Sanitation is non-existent. Disease is rampant. The life expectancy of a child born in these slums is 10 years less than those living in the developed world. Robert Gilman, a public health specialist, knows that water is at the heart of the community's problems. Hola, señora. ¿Cómo está? Water is crucial. You need it for drinking, you need it for washing. Washing means cleanliness. Cleanliness means uh, diarrhea. If you don't have cleanliness, you get diarrhea, you get other diseases. So this is a major risk factor for these uh, individuals for disease. He has worked in Lima slums for over 10 years. No tiene dinero. Water here is absolutely necessary. One, this area is a desert, as you can see when you look around. There's no water around. Two, right now it's the summer. It's hot. This is the time when diarrhea occurs. Why does diarrhea occur more? Because there's less water and the bacteria can grow much faster. It's hardly surprising that intestinal infections are common to these slums. 
What is surprising is that the most serious waterborne infection of all, cholera, was until recently non-existent. Many of the grave sites of Lima's cemeteries are grim reminders of a national disaster. They all have one thing in common. They mark the beginning of the largest cholera epidemic to strike the Western Hemisphere. The year was 1991. This was a time when funeral processions became common throughout Peru. A time when an entire country went into mourning. The cholera epidemic began in a small coastal fishing village about 250 miles north of the nation's capital. Within days, Lima became a hot zone. Victims started arriving at local hospitals every few minutes. Cholera causes severe diarrhea and vomiting. This quickly dehydrates the patient. Death can come within hours. The treatment is to quickly rehydrate the patient by mouth or more often intravenously. Within weeks, Peru's medical facilities were overwhelmed by the disease. Hospital personnel desperately tried to cope with the growing epidemic. Oh, it is catastrophic. It's a catastrophe. It is more than an epidemic, an outbreak. Uh, uh, it is a disaster for Peru. Because the epidemic began in a fishing village, many thought seafood might be responsible. This nearly destroyed the export markets for Peruvian fish. Fishermen and their relatives staged angry demonstrations. The reality is, raw fish was never the problem, provided it was washed in clean water. Cholera is transmitted when infected human waste contaminates the water supply. It is a disease of the poor. In Lima's wealthy neighborhoods, cholera claimed very few victims. Here, people can afford to drink bottled water. Within a month, the epidemic crossed the Andes and struck the Amazonian port city of Iquitos. In its slums, people bathe in and drink the same river water they use as a toilet. It didn't take long for cholera to spread north until it reached Mexico. Ultimately, a disease which was thought to have disappeared from the Americas left a harsh legacy. More than a million people infected, 11,000 dead. For now, the cholera epidemic is long gone. Daily life has returned to normal. Yet Lima's semi-treated sewage still pours into the Pacific, just a few hundred yards off these popular beaches. This raises an urgent question. Can impoverished cities provide adequate sanitation systems to cope with growing populations? The answer is, they can. One of Lima's largest shanty towns Via El Salvador looked like this 30 years ago. An urban invasion of the desert, a village without electricity or water. Today, Via El Salvador is a thriving community. Praised by the United Nations, it's an example of what can happen when the poor organize to develop their own infrastructure. Via El Salvador has paved streets and electricity. It established a small manufacturing sector, which provides employment opportunities, and a chance to escape the chains of grinding poverty. Communal health centers and kitchens cater to those in need. 
above all else, Via El Salvador has a sewage system and clean running water. Its success has also shown the way to other, younger shanty towns like Ventanilla, which is just beginning to improve its infrastructure. This is a major advance for this community. This sewer and running water mean that there will be probably 70% less episodes of diarrhea, and obviously this translates into much lower mortality rates and morbidity rates for the community. Water, again, is the clue. Sewage brings hygiene. This is what was missing with the cholera epidemic. Today, the fishing industry is back to normal, and cholera is now under control. But until recently, no one really knew what caused the sudden epidemic. In 1991, there was a major El Nino event in the Pacific. This resulted in the warming of the ocean along the 2,000 mile coastline of Peru, creating the perfect conditions for a massive growth of algae, which also nourished the toxic cholera bacterium. Scientists have now discovered why cholera outbreaks are triggered by the periodic warming of ocean waters. Peru offers a dramatic example of how a cholera epidemic can explode. The waters of Peru were warmed by a very intense El Nino, which occurred in 90, 91, 92 period. This led to very large increases in plankton populations of the type that carry the cholera bacteria. We now know the peaks of cholera epidemics are the result of people drinking water that contain large numbers of these plankton, which in turn contain large numbers of the cholera bacterium. Today, unclean water is the dominant factor in places suffering from poverty, overcrowding, and the spread of infectious disease. In places where a toilet is just a hole in the ground. Nowhere is this more evident than in one of the poorest countries on earth, Bangladesh. Located in South Asia, it is virtually surrounded by India, with the Bay of Bengal to the south, and the world's highest mountain range looming to the north, the Himalayas. Here, over 135 million people live in a country the size of New York State, with more than 9 million crowded into the capital, Dhaka. This is a city struggling to enter the 21st century. Now that we have such a mobile population, people from here can be in any other part of the world uh, within a day or two. Areas like this are hot zones. They are areas where there's a lot of crowding, uh, population density, and therefore the opportunity for a lot of infection. Each day, thousands pour into Dhaka from the countryside. Nearly all come in search of a better quality of life. For most, the city has little to offer. This is a place whose fragile infrastructure is squeezed hard by the dispossessed and poor. Clean water and sanitation are rare commodities. Disease is rampant, especially for children. There's an ancient superstition that a black circle painted on a child's face will ward off disease, sometimes even death. It's a commonly practiced custom. Yet over 9% of children born in Bangladesh die before the age of five. Just after the rainy season, the country suffers from major outbreaks of cholera. This is when hospitals look more like battlefields 
littered with casualties of war. Each year, the disease strikes nearly half a million Bangladeshis. It claims 25,000 lives. Dr. George Fuchs has devoted his career to fighting the disease. We see about uh, 120,000 patients a year. So I, I think it's uh, pretty apparent that uh, Bangladesh has uh, the highest rates of cholera in the world. So uh, this is a perfect place for us to study this severe illness. We've converted this hallway into a ward because right now is our peak time for diarrheal disease. Uh, the, the conditions are, are perfect to allow cholera and other organisms to thrive right now. That the ambient temperature is su sufficiently warm. Uh, the amount of water in the uh, atmosphere all create an environment that allows cholera to flourish. Unlike Peru, epidemics in Bangladesh are annual events tied to the seasonal ebb and flow of water. This is a part of the world defined by water. And at its heart is a great river estuary. A complex highway of rivers and streams rising in India and the Himalayas that slowly make their way into the Bay of Bengal. In the rural countryside, in the thousands of small villages, nearly everything revolves around water. Here, daily life hasn't changed in decades. But there is one other constant. Most of the land is just a few feet above sea level. For two months each year, monsoons sweep across the Bay of Bengal and flood much of Bangladesh. Tens of millions are left homeless. In the Bay of Bengal, during the monsoon, there's a brackish water warmer water, ideal for the bloom of plankton, and of course, subsequently, the epidemics of cholera as a result of people drinking the water directly without filtration, without chlorination. When the waters recede, nearly every river and pond is tainted with the deadly cholera bacterium. To ease the problem of cholera, the government drilled five million wells to provide clean drinking water for 97% of the rural population. This simple act may have saved millions of lives, but it also resulted in an unforeseen public health disaster. Not long ago, rural health workers reported signs of a mysterious ailment Villagers were developing skin lesions. Nausea and hemorrhaging often followed. These were the signs of arsenic poisoning, a slow-acting but fatal disease. Shastri is 27. She probably won't live to 30. There is no cure for arsenic poisoning. It turns out that much of Bangladesh's underground water supply contains naturally occurring arsenic. With almost 70 million at risk, the people of Bangladesh now face the largest mass poisoning in history. Lack of clean water leaves people with very few choices. It is one of the world's biggest killers. The estimate is that there are 250 million cases of water-related diseases a year. Three to five million people die a year, 20 or 30,000 perhaps a day, from water-related diseases that we know how to prevent, that are easy to prevent and to cure, but that we failed to prevent. 
with a patience forged by the seasonal rhythms of an ancient landscape. The people of Bangladesh struggle with waterborne diseases. This has become part of a global problem, a problem that is not limited to the countries of the developing world. The Chesapeake Bay is North America's largest estuary. With over 11,000 miles of shoreline and fed by 48 major rivers, it supports nearly 300 species of fish. The people of Crisfield, Maryland have been working the bay for over 300 years. Not very long ago, this small fishing village of 3,000 boasted the largest registry of sailing vessels in the United States. This was once home to over 150 oyster processing plants. Today, Crisfield's watermen are suffering a serious decline in their catch. The bay is showing the effects of sewage, pesticides, and industrial effluents that have been seeping into the Chesapeake for decades. It's the end of the crabbing season, the time to pull in their traps for the winter. They're taking in crab traps now, Till. Uh, we're finishing the season up. Robert Daniels is not very hopeful. Well, I'm not optimistic about the future because, number one, uh, the decline in crabs. Number two, to some kind of disease that gets into our oysters. I don't know, when it hits an oyster bed, it seems like every oyster on the oyster bed dies. Oysterman Robert Hamilton has seen his livelihood eroded year by year. It's bad right now. Both all of the rivers have this disease in them, and it's, it's killing them. In a lot of places, are a lot worse than this. Some places are 100% dead. But hopefully, we've got to look around until we find a place we can make some kind of day's work, make some kind of living. It, it's really, it's, it doesn't look like very much of a future unless you stop dying in this business. Several years ago, watermen like Jack Howard began to notice grotesque lesions in the fish and crabs they were catching. I've been a commercial fisherman most of my life. And we noticed we had a lot of fish with lesions and sores on them. And some of them had portions of uh, the top of their heads eaten down to their skulls, to their eyes, and they had basically parts of their bodies just completely eaten away like acid. There was worse to come. Not long after the fish started getting sick, so did the watermen. We started getting sick ourselves, and the symptoms we had was diarrhea, memory loss, and it got to the point that we were so sick sometimes and, and the stomach cramps were so violent that you, you just couldn't do anything. As more and more watermen became sick, the alarm bells sounded. That's when scientists suspected that human impacts on the bay were the reason fish and watermen were getting ill. There's a lot of nutrient load coming from farmlands. There's a lot of microbiological issues coming from human waste. We have leaking uh, sewer lines that are contaminating the bay with human waste that causes uh, potentially outbreaks of human pathogens. The first suspect was a toxic algae called Fisteria. Further research showed that the problem was much more complex. Many microorganisms were involved, not just Fisteria. What we now know is that those open lesions are caused by a fungus, not by Fisteria. What we don't know is what relationship Fisteria and the fungus have to each other. For instance, some people have suggested that Fisteria toxin damages the skin and allows the fungal agent to get in and cause those lesions. We don't know exactly where the fungus comes from, but we're pretty sure it is a terrestrial source. So runoff is, is an important factor, and we need to understand where does it come from. Today, research continues. The fish are still dying, and the watermen of Crisfield continue to suffer. 
And just as the invasion of West Nile virus has raised the alarm in the richer countries of the world about the threat of new insect-borne diseases, the still puzzling sickness of the Chesapeake is just one more warning about the growing problem of waterborne diseases. Fortunately, there are programs that are beginning to offer glimmers of hope for a variety of public health problems. In the jungles of Peru, clinics have been established in rural villages, introducing vaccination programs that promise to ease the suffering from the mosquito-borne disease yellow fever. In Bangladesh, rural health workers are teaching women simple sanitation procedures that will help protect their families from cholera and other serious illnesses like arsenic poisoning. In the slums of Dhaka, clinical trials on a new oral vaccine for E. coli hold great promise to ease the suffering of infants. And in Kenya, medical researchers are helping local authorities eradicate the breeding grounds for the deadly Anopheles mosquito. Important programs, yes, but still not nearly enough to reverse the debilitating effects of insect and waterborne diseases that kill nearly 15 million people each year. We are increasingly now part of a global community. And it's not just that a disease may be more prevalent in one area or another, but also that economies and people are increasingly interdependent. Disease and economics and security are entwined. And when you can make a contribution to the health of a country, you tend to increase its stability and better its economy. Clearly what we have to do is provide for the developing countries the capacity for safe drinking water. Because this means we reduce disease. This means poverty can be addressed in a powerful way. Though there are no easy answers, no quick fixes, fortunately, there are those who are working hard to ease the burden. In the end, the health of those living in places like the Chesapeake Bay in New York City cannot be separated from the well-being of those living in Peru, Kenya, and Bangladesh. This presents us with enormous challenges, requiring new ideas, new attitudes, new hope. Planet Earth, this is our home. This is where our journey of discovery must begin.